Welcome to Bible study here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School on Revelation. I am your teacher, your host, whatever you want to call me, your vicar. Anyway, Josh Laborious. I have been teaching these. I've been making these videos. Um, this is video number on chapter 9. It's video number 10, I believe. Um, so if this is the first video on Revelation you're watching, welcome. You are welcome to stick around and watch this video, or I would encourage you to go to the playlist this video is on. You can find that at St. Paul Lutheran Church and Schools uh, homepage on their channel, on our channel, which if you click the link right below this video to the channel, you can see that and you can watch chapters one through nine and, and all the way through 22. Um, if not, if you have been watching, if this is, you know, just the next step in, in your video watching experience for Revelation, welcome back. Um, and regardless of whether this is your first or your 30th video watching with St. Paul, I would encourage you go ahead and subscribe to our channel below. Um, if you subscribe, then anytime we have a new devotion, a new Bible study, a, a live worship service going, uh, it'll let you know. And that way you can stay up to date and you can continue to grow in your faith, to grow in your relationship with Christ through the materials on this channel. So um, I believe that's all the shameless plugs I have for you today. And with that, we're going to step into the material. As I said, this is the video on Revelation chapter 9. And if you'll recall in, in the previous video, in the previous chapter, in Revelation 8, we were talking about um, so these visions of heaven that John is having. And in Revelation 8, the final seal, there were seven seals that were opened. The final seal is opened. And then f the first of seven, the first four of seven trumpets were blown and, and things happen every time one of these trumpets is blown. And then chapter 8 ends with a warning. And it ends with a warning that, that all of the kind of terrifying things that John has been seeing kind of pale in comparison for what's coming next. And that's what we're going to see here in chapter 9. We're going to see those things that are it getting worse. So strap in, get ready, buckle up. Here we go into Revelation 9. I'd encourage you to go ahead and get your Bible out or get your Bible pulled up on your phone, on your computer, however you prefer to interact with the, the Bible. I like my, my physical Bible um, mainly because I've I've stuck with it so long. It's got my notes. It's got my, my little markers on the side. Um, yeah. Anyway, regardless, we are in Revelation chapter 9. It is the ninth chapter in Revelation. If you are in this exact version of the Bible, it's on page 2,213. You're probably not in this exact same version, so it's near the end. Um, but we are going to step into this text. I'd encourage you to follow along in whatever you have in front of you. It says, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven and earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In, the, in appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. So there's a lot there. And by all accounts, it's it's a lot of pretty heavy symbolism. So we are going to walk through that. Um, starting at the beginning, kind of walking through. We start at the beginning and it says, 
there's this star that has fallen from heaven to earth. And what is what is being seen here is that throughout Revelation, in fact, throughout the scriptures, stars are representative of angels. So when we talk about a star falling to from heaven to earth, we're talking about an angel falling from heaven to earth. And when we say fallen angel, who are we talking about? We're talking about Satan. Satan is a fallen angel. Um, and he is given the key to the bottomless pit. So what is a bottomless pit? What is the bottomless pit? I, it's the thing in the movie 300 they kick someone into. No, it's, uh, it refers to a realm, to an area forsaken by God. Um, so some incarnation of hell is what we're talking about here. This is the realm of demons. And we kind of know that because later in Revelation, a demonic beast emerges from this pit. Um, now this, this angel given the key, this fallen angel is later identified as the angel of the abyss. So we would, these are all different ways of describing Satan is kind of how we would address that. And then from the shaft, from this bottomless pit, uh, rose smoke. Now this language that's used here, it's reminiscent of an Old Testament story, and that is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the smoldering room, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, they were immoral towns. They were unrepentant in their sin. And, when, and God completely destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. See, before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham pleaded with him. He said, if there, if there are 20, if there are 15, if there are 10 righteous people in this town, will you spare it? And God says, if there are 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I will spare them. And there weren't even 10 righteous people. So he, with all of his destructive power, he destroys, justifiably, righteously destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And the, the smoldering remains are described in a way very similar to this, where the, the smoke is rising like a furnace, the air is, and the sun is darkened. And so what we're seeing here is it's very symbolic of God's wrath. And this darkness that's rising can very easily be connected with the rise of spiritual darkness. And this covers the whole earth. And that's the language here. And then from this smoke comes locusts. And as is fairly evident from the way they're described, they're, they're not described like little bugs. They, they have all these other descriptors that we will get to in a second. Hold your horses. We're going to get there in a second. Um, but they're given the power of spirit scorpions to afflict people not plants and that's kind of where it's departing from what happens in chapter 8 because in chapter 8 all of the all of the plagues all of the the terrifying things that are happening they're happening to the world and indirectly affecting people but not directly impacting people this is a direct impact on humanity on People, So that's kind of where we start to see this departure from the previous things that have been going on. Um, and we may ask, well, why locusts? Well, locusts have long been a plague that people have had to deal with naturally. So you, you have this kind of natural occurrence of, of plagues of locusts that destroy crops, they cause hunger and famine, etc., etc. And also supernaturally. So, for example, in Egypt, God sends a plague of locusts. Um, locusts are thought of as unstoppably destructive. Once a plague of locusts descends on, on a field or on a crop or on an area, there's not much you can do to stop them. Even today, with our advanced uses of pesticides and genetically modified organisms that are resistant to bugs, um, there's not much even we can do today, um, and even more so back in these times. Could So they're representative of God's fury, and what's really important is it's an image that people are familiar with. Because what John is about to describe here, what he is about to see, is a, is a dramatically unfamiliar thing happening. So he, we're given this contact point of, you ever seen a plague of locusts? It's kind of like this. He goes, ever seen a plague of lo locusts? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, so it has all those connotations of unstoppable, it's destructive, it, it's supernatural punishment, that kind of thing. Um, and what's interesting is both here and in the Old Testament book of Joel, they are representatively used as hordes of demons. They're, they 
talk about hordes of demons as akin to a plague of locusts. Um, now, the, the interesting thing here is they are told not to harm the grass. So right off the bat, we know these are not normal locusts because normal locusts go after plants. These locusts are instructed to go after people. So that's kind of like a flag right there. Like, yo, this is symbolic. Um, I have a bunch of fla flags on my wall, as you can see. I should have grabbed one and waved it around. Anyway, not the point. Beside the point. Focus. Focus. Um, so they're, they're told that they can torment people who don't have the seal of God. This, this does not mean that the people of God are not going to suffer. Don't hear that. That just means they're not going to suffer from this particular thing. The suffering of the people of God, that's going to be talked about later. We will get to that because that is something that takes place. That's something that Jesus promised in his ministry. Um, if someone told you that Christianity is a way to make all your problems disappear and you're not going to suffer at all, someone lied to you. Um, but that's not the point of this particular section of text. So they're allowed to torment them for five months. Um, you may ask, well, why five months? Well, that might have been the typical length of a locust plague. But in reality, no one has really connected a real significance to this particular number other than the fact that it is a finite length of time. Um, so there's there's a kind of cool connection if you go back to the book of Job, which is like the quintessential book uh, when you want to talk about God allowing suffering for his people. Um, in Job, the devil is limited in his permissions. He cannot kill Job in the same way these locusts, they're not allowed to kill people. Um, and it talks about this their torment being that of a scorpion, whether that's mental or physical suffering. Um, it's not really specified, but what is really interesting is uh, if you look at scorpions and what happens when they sting people, the vast majority of them are actually not fatal. They hurt. They hurt a lot. They're very painful. They can be excruciating, but a lot of times they're not fatal. Um, so th that's kind of the connection going with they're not allowed to kill people. Even those people, it says they're going to seek death but not find it. They are not allowed to be killed. They are not allowed to die. And you may say, well, that, why, why that? Why that way? Um, and I want to remind you that the point of the entire book of Revelation is, is bringing people to redemption, bringing people to salvation. So what this does is it brings startling attention to their lost condition. It brings them to the point where where they are ready to hopefully ready to turn to God. And it's 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 not letting them die because then they can turn to God. Um, and it brings us this this reality that death as a relief, which is what they're seeking after. They're seeking death here as a relief, but that is an illusion for an unbeliever because if you die as an unbeliever, this is a harsh statement, but you're, you're going to hell. That is what we believe. That is what the Bible teaches. So we may think of death as a relief, as a release, but the reality is if you are outside of Christ, death is not a relief. It's not a release into anything except for worse torment than in life. So um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but and it's a little bit of a dark tangent. So not taking away from the reality of it, but uh, then we're going to step away from that into the appearance of these locusts. And the following description really emphasizes the reality that this isn't some ordinary plague. Um, they're described like horses prepared to rush into battle. Uh, they're prepared, these, these demons, these locusts, they're prepared to rush forward against ma mankind like a cavalry charge. Kind of an unstoppable force going forward. On their head, they're wearing crowns. It looks like crowns, which means they have the illusion of victory. They are not true warriors of God. They are warriors of Satan who are nevertheless employed by God for his own good purposes. Um, so that's kind of, and like we've talked about in many of the videos before, in, in this time, in this text, uh, crown is more connected with victory than it is with royalty. When you won in the arena, when you won in, in situations like that, you were the winner was given the crown, um, which is an important distinction because in our society today, uh, what we associate crown with royalty, with kings and queens, etc. So 
Um, their faces are like human faces, which implies, which symbolizes human intelligence and cunning. And then it talks about the, the women's hair, human beauty, and some sort of cruel attraction, which brings us to this reality that the destruction of man is attractive. And something I would ask you to consider for yourself is what are some ways that destruction, that self-destruction particularly, might be attractive? Um and this, we get into a discussion about addiction and sin that we, we can recognize that we can say, oh, this is harmful for our lives. And yet, will you continue to live in that way? Um, as we continue through this descri description, uh, it talks about their teeth like lion's teeth. This is ferocity. This is savageness, uh, physical, mental, or emotional damage. Whatever the damage they are doing, it is severe and it is extreme. And then it talks about they're wearing this breastplate, like a breastplate of iron. And there's a lot of significance here. You see, the, the breastplate is the armor of a foot soldier. In Joel, when he talks like this, he's comparing to Goliath. The connection here might be to the Romans. They are impervious to their victor, victims. And the, the reason that it's significant that the breastplate is the armor of the foot soldier is because that means they are the least in the army. So this, these terrifying things that are being unleashed on the world, they're the least in the army of, of the devil's forces. Um, and then it talks about the, the noise that they have. Um, the noise of their wings is like the noise of many chariots. Even, even the hint of their approach is terrifying. Their approach could be deafening. They have tails like scorpion tails. Uh, scorpion stings, like I said earlier, they are incredibly painful. I don't know from personal experience. I have never been stung by a scorpion because when I see one, I am a wise human being and give it its space. Um, but they're usually not fatal. And one of the most deadly in the world is the death stalker, which you'd think, oh, that sounds super deadly. The reality is most healthy adults still survive its sting. Um, so, like I said before, this is torment, not death. And then it says they have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is Apollyon. Um, we're going to get some more details on this character later. Both of these names, Abaddon in Greek and Apollyon in, or Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek, those are both. Um, those are both translate when they're translated literally into English, they mean destroyer, which defines his purpose here. So at that point, I want to take a little tangent onto into the names of Satan, on onto the subject of the character, the, the person of Satan. Um, so the names of Satan, we have uh Satan as accuser. So we have Satan as a, a, is accuser, which his function uh, in, in the life of a Christian is primarily this. It is an, he is an accuser who tries to convince us that we are not forgiven. That despite what we are told, despite what we read in the gospel, we cannot be forgiven because our sin is too egregious. Our sin is too serious. It's too severe. Um, and at this point, I want to, I want to share something with you. And I don't know who you are watching this. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you've done. I don't, I don't know what church background you're from, but what I would encourage you to do is in the Lutheran church, we do still practice private confession and absolution. Um, we do corporate, we, we do in worship, we do confession and absolution where it's, we confess as a body of Christ and we are forgiven as a body of Christ. And that is phenomenal. But if something is weighing you down, you can come into the, like if you were to come into this office right now, what would happen is our, the, the people up front uh, would, they would let you know, they would send you back to my office. And I would, I would bring you in here. I would close the door. The blinds would stay open because um, that's the world we live in now. The blinds would stay open, but and you would be free, you would confess to me. And that, that confession is protection, protected by privacy. It is my calling, it is my duty to keep that private. But then I would go through and I would say, I, on behalf of God, you are forgiven these sins. And we would talk about them. And I, I have to be honest, as a seminarian, which is the schooling you go through uh, to become a pastor, I'm two years in, part of our requirement is we have to go through 
private confession and absolution. We have to go to the chaplain on campus and we go through that experience. So we've experienced that. And I want to tell you right now, it is incredibly freeing to have someone in a one-on-one -on -one situation who, who knows exactly what your sins are and still says to you, God forgives you, God loves you, and shares with you scripture that applies to your situation. It is powerful. It is freeing. So if you, if you are weighted down by burdens of guilt of your sin, I would encourage you, seek out that private confession and absolution. Let someone speak those words of the gospel directly into your life, directly into your situation, um, and bring you the incredible peace that comes with it. So a little bit of a tangent there, a little, but something I, I want to put before you. And because the reality is Satan as accuser, as destroyer, whatever uh, name he carries, we don't talk about him too much. Because there is a danger in talking about him too much because there's this reality of, of losing accountability. Because there's a temptation if you if you put too much emphasis on Satan to say, oh, Satan made me do it, the devil made me do it, etc., etc. Because then it becomes, I'm not the one sinning, the devil's just making me sin, I'm not actually at fault. But the reality is we are at fault. We are responsible for our own broken condition. Um, but there is the reality of, if we don't talk about, he is at work in our world. He, he is actively at work in our world. So I think we do a disservice if we don't talk about fighting the devil and, and the spiritual warfare at all. So here I am talking about it. Um, and something that uh, a professor once shared with me that I thought was profound and was really cool and helpful is pray out loud. Because we know the devil's powerful, we do, but he's not omnipotent. He doesn't know your thoughts. God can hear it when you pray in your head, but the devil doesn't know your thoughts. The devil's not in your head. And we forget that. We forget that the devil's not omnipotent. And my professor, what he was explaining this, he said, so pray out loud. Because the name of Jesus Christ is powerful. And if the devil hears you say, praying to Jesus Christ, that is terrifying to him. Who are we? We are nothing. But when we when we are praying to Christ, when we are talking to God in that way, and, and we pray out loud and the devil can hear that, then God's power uh, is, is powerful and works in that space. So um, all of that to say our struggle as Christians with the devil is more uh, as an adversary um, and as accuser, which are the names Satan and devil kind of play to, they, they translate as adversary and accuser. The focus here in Revelation to, to bring us back into the text is uh, Apollyon, Abaddon, is his destructive capabilities. That's where the focus is. Um, so there's the reality. Again, this is not this particular section of text is not directed at believers. But what I would encourage you to do is to reflect a little bit. Where is Satan attacking you? And where can you pray in those situations? Where can you bring your pastor or your Christian friends into those situations to support you in those places where Satan might be attacking you? So with that as an opportunity, we're going to kind of come back into the text at verse 13. We're going to look at verses 13 through 21 and finish off this chapter 9. It says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion heads. The fire and, and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses in, is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them... They wound. The rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or, or walk. Nor did they repent of their, their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. 
So we see the sixth, the sixth trumpet here, uh, a voice from the four horns. This is the altar of God. Uh, this could be the angel referenced er earlier who has the incense. It could be the saints under the altar who are talked about elsewhere in Revelation. There's also probably this reality that it is both. It is the voice of all the saints, those who are who are under the altar, who are already with God. Uh, the angel, angel with the incense, those are the prayers of the saints on earth. So this could just be the collectively the voice of all the saints um, speaking to the sixth, the sixth angel. Um, there is this possible connection with earlier in Revelation with the sixth trumpet and the sixth church. And if you're like, what on earth are you talking about? Go back and watch those videos. This is a shared experience, even with the faithful who are safe on earth. Um, so it talks about releasing these angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Um, and you may say, well, what's up with that? Well, it comes from a place and a direction. The Euphrates comes from a place and a direction that is the north, which historically is where Israel's enemies have come from. And also where it speaks throughout the Old Testament, the eschatological, that is the, the end times, eschatology is the study of the end times. So the eschatologically, uh, eschatological, yikes, that is a hard word to say multiple times in one sentence. The, the end enemies of God's people come from. So you have these four angels, and it's a definite group of four. When it's spoken of, it is a def defined group. These are angels, not demons. To be very clear, these are angels, not demons. That is not a misinterpretation, but they are angels of judgment and punishment. They are prepared for this task. They go forward and they kill a third of mankind. That is a staggering and terrifying number. That is billions of people. And they release the, this, this army, this number that is, uh, it's an armor, army that is staggering. The number is incredible. This is a demonic, and so these angels released the demons um, by fire and smoke and sulfur. This is a demonic plague that is killing people. And, and there's the suggestion here as you go forward is that they are tormenting even those two-thirds that aren't killed. But what's crazy here and what boggles my mind is that the rest don't repent. They have seen these things. And I would say you can't have a more plain sign of conviction. You have demonic hordes going after the world. What more would it take for you to believe that you need forgiveness from God? You need God's protection. But they continue in their idolatry. They continue in evil. Um, so I have, I have two things. Uh, one, this points to the reality that we are incapable on our own of coming to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit's work in us that brings us to Christ. But the second thing is they continue in evil despite the fact that they have been convicted. So my question to you, and this is what I'm going to close on, and I know this is a kind of a tough chapter, um, but we got to keep in mind that this is all with the goal of trying to bring more people to repentance because the, the whole of Revelation is about Jesus Christ and his salvation for those who are in him, who have faith in him. Um, but the question I want to close on is, is a law question. It's a challenging question for you. And that is, what are some sins that you cling to even in the midst of the law's conviction? And I had a professor at one point who asked a very similar question to our class. And I think frequently we, we say things like, um, the next time I do that thing that I know I shouldn't be doing, it's, it's going to be the last time. And my professor, Dr. Kolb, he said, no, brothers, brothers and sisters, the last time was the last time. So to call it whatever sin you're struggling with, even though you know it's wrong, I'm going to challenge you. Make the last time that you struggled with it, the, the last time you gave in, the last time you, you committed that sin, that rebellion, that crime against God, make that the last time. Um, so that's where we're going to close Revelation chapter 9. Again, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel um, up above me. There's also Revelation 10 will be linked to this video. So if you want, you can just watch all the way through. Um, and I would encourage you to subscribe to St. Paul to get all of the different uh, awesome Bible studies. There's one going on right now with Pastor Andrew. And the plan is going forward, all the Bible studies that we will hopefully eventually have back in person on campus, they'll still be online for you. Um, all of the devotions Pastor Steve does, all of the live worship, it's all on here. So subscribe so you can have access 
to all of that stuff to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ as, as we at St. Paul celebrate, share, and care together. So with that, brothers and sisters, I would encourage you, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.